Thank you for joining us. Panera Bread is available every Sunday from 10 to 12 in the fellowship hall. Brother Robert will take care of you. Uh, our Sunday school classes are being done on Zoom for the most part. And if you would like to join a class and are not in a class right now, you just look at that email that Miss Connie sends out every Thursday or Friday, and the, the links are on that, and you will be able to join a class. The same thing with our sermons. They are available uh, via Facebook, by email, or on the website. And you can uh, the, the Sunday morning service from Pastor Mike is available at 9 a.m. The evening service that I do is available at 6 p.m. On Wednesday nights, we do the prayer meeting via Zoom. And that, that link for that is available uh, on the email that we send you every week. If you have any prayer requests, please send them to CBC Secretary at 1165 at gmail.com. And we'll ensure that those get on our prayer list for the week. Um, as, and... and just want you to continue to pray for each other and to uh, reach out to each other uh, in the Lord. And thank you uh, once again for your support as we go through this difficult time. Good morning, Centerview family of faith. I am so delighted to welcome you to this Sunday morning's worship services with the family of faith here at Centerview Baptist Church. We welcome those who are viewing from literally around the world. One of our uh, dear families that are in Malaysia right now that happen to be my uh, son-in-law and daughter and, and grands said, please tell me you're going to keep doing the taping of the services after you come back to public worship services at church. Yes. Why? Yes, we are. We're going to keep up this effort because we are literally welcoming people from around the world uh, to worship with us. And we are grateful for this opportunity. This is a beautiful Lord's Day. And of course, we uh, have just received notification from our state governor that we are entering phase two. So let me say, your leadership team, your ministry leadership team, your pastors, your deacon officers are meeting soon and very soon, today. And we are going to be discussing the plans for going forward. So I'm not going to share details expressly, but soon and very soon, we are going to start worshiping again in person. Let me give you a few highlights that I can feel safely confident that the leadership team as a whole will, will absolutely agree to. We are going to have a blend between being good citizens, obeying the governor and authorities, and uh, making sure that we do social distancing. In fact, very excitedly, we have already kind of scrunched the pews, not all, uh, kind of, we have scrunched the pews together. Our seating capacity has been reduced to 229 in the sanctuary. Uh, the fire regulation codes call for more than a, uh, 700 in, in attendance at one time. We're going to be less than 30% of that. We're going to do multiple services. We're going to shorten the services because we're not going to have nurseries. So the kiddos will be with us. And so their attention span is only so long. We're going to get her done in, in 45 minutes. It's going to be my, my effort. Got to work harder to preach uh, shorter and, and get it all in. We're going to make sure that no one is made to be uncomfortable, that will allow six feet between families or between individuals that don't live in the same household. We are going to be cleaning in between the services. We will do multiple services in order to keep it shorter. Stay tuned very soon for details on how that will happen. We are open to having a Friday night service, to having three Sunday morning services, to having our, our normal evening service. So uh, probably it won't entail Sunday school during Phase two, the reason for that being our hallway in the Children's Center, for example, is six feet wide. How can one family with kids in tow pass another family with kids in tow and be at least six feet apart? It's really not possible in the Children's Center. So for now, we'll be worshiping together, which will be a big praise. We'll come in one door, go out another door. We'll have hand sanitizer. We'll be so um, clean that it'll, it's just going to be wonderful. You'll be able to smell Lysol and say, wow, this is a clean facility. So details to follow. That's all I'm going to say by way of welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. Stay tuned to the net and for uh, our multimedia experts that are going to get the word out quickly, quickly, quickly. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And as we look back, I look back at the letter we first wrote to you. We had seven points and it began with prayer. It ended with prayer and we social responsibility was there. Submission to governing authorities was there. Most of all, what was there was pray, depend on the Lord. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So we've been operating out of faith, not out of fear. And we are uh, so excited that, to look back and see that you know, God gave us the right game plan. 
and we've made it through phase one. The budget has been sustained. We believe that our reach has actually increased. More people have been uh, tuning in than were able to even come. I, 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 we don't have the specifics on that, but it's our strong conviction. So we're grateful for how God has brought us through. And we're excited about this next challenge. Things differently, but are going to be done with excellence, excellence and for the glory of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer with a spirit of thankfulness for all he's done and a spirit of prayerfulness for what lies before us. Father, you are our creator, God. There is none like unto thee. There never has been. There never will be. The prophet Isaiah said, I am the Lord thy God. There is none other. And you yourself said, Lord, and he quoted you, I know not one. Thank you, Father. You are seated squarely on your throne, that you are the sovereign one. You are the ancient of days. You rule and you reign and your will stands. Thank you, Father, that in your sovereignty, you've called us. You've chosen us to be your children. And though all things in life are not good, you've told us because you have called us to love you and to know you. You are the God who, as our Heavenly Father, is in all things working for our good. And we praise you, Lord, for what you have done. We praise you for the general good health that we've been having. We know that we have people in need of prayer right now, Master, and we cry out for them. Uh, Father, right now, for those who are facing procedures this week, for those who are, frankly, in depression with the lockdown and so many challenges, with, young, with even kiddos, Lord, that are dismayed, God, may your grace be showered all over them. Thank you, Lord, that you are the God who will supply all of our needs, our mental needs, our emotional needs, our physical needs our health needs in accordance with the riches and glory you have in store for us through Christ Jesus. But we do thank you, Lord, for being so faithful, for uh, keeping this church sustained. Thank you, King Jesus, that you are the head of this church and you've told us the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Thank you for our staff and for our volunteers who've served you so faithfully. And Lord, we just pray by your amazing grace that the efforts will continue, that the good news of Jesus Christ, our risen our crucified and risen Lord and Savior, our ruling and reigning Lord and Savior will be made known from this pulpit even to the ends of the world for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us have a missionary moment. I'm going to begin today trying to shorten things up. Oh, it's a tall task, but we're going to try to do it. So we have a missionary in focus. Have you ever been to Toronto, Ontario? I have. I lived in Detroit, Michigan for the first 17 years of my life. Right across the Detroit River is the great uh, province of Ontario, Canada, and the great city of Toronto. We have an IMB missionary there, Brett Porter. He's with the International Mission Board, the Southern Baptist Convention. We're going to pray that God will give fruit to Brett's ministry. Our offertory scripture throughout the month of May, one more Sunday of May, uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. And his righteousness and all these things. Jesus was talking in the context of those who were worrying over what to wear, what to eat. And he said, look at how God provides for the lilies of the valley. Look how he provides for the fowl of the air. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. And what is the promise? And all these things shall be added unto you. The very next verse says, take no thought for the morrow. That's a good word for us today. Don't be worrisome. Sufficient to the day are the troubles thereof. But God's grace is sufficient. Father, use our brother in Toronto. Thank you for that great, booming city. And Lord, we know it is a city that needs the good news of Jesus. So bless and strengthen and empower Brett to share that good news with care as he preaches the word of, of truth from your scripture. In Jesus' name and for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for how you sustained us. And we look forward, Father, to seeing how you're going to lead us, guide us, and provide for us in the days ahead through your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, dear ones, at this time, we invite you to worship with the praise team. I've asked them expressly to sing this song for us. Here I am to worship. A little definition is given in the song. Here I am to bow down. Let's worship with the praise team.
Once again, dear ones, we're so glad and, uh, to be back in the Word of God with you today. And I want to say we are taking a break from our break. What do you mean, Pastor? We had been journeying through First John when the pandemic struck us. We took a break. We've been in the book of Philippians, a few other places as well, looking for encouragement on Sunday mornings from God's Word. We looked at the theme of joyous unity from the book of Philippians. It's a time when we need to be unified. It's a time when we need a little joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Today, watching so many news channels um, about COVID-19 and doing church life has been uh, on the news. Here's the situation. In this day and age, I kind of hate to watch the news and I kind of hate not to watch the news. Ah, it's a painful choice either way. But there are a lot of church leaders who are doing some uh, good things and a lot of church leaders who are doing some strange things. So what can I say? We are living in unprecedented times. And you don't need yet another person pontificating in your life about COVID-19 or its origins or the future, which only Christ knows. I do want to say I was dismayed this week when I heard a politician use these phrases. She was a, a failed presidential candidate, and she made this statement. Remember what the old adage says, never waste a good crisis. And let's make no doubt about it. She was talking about exploiting the pandemic for her purposes, one of which, in her words, was to ensure the right of every woman to reproductive health during this crisis. Code interpretation? Abortion on demand, even during the pandemic. Dear ones, it troubles me when someone exploits a crisis for this purpose. And yet, I have a book in my office called Do Not Waste Your Sorrows. The purpose of that book, written by a man named um, Bill Heimer, is that in <laughs> troublesome things in our life, God has rolled up his sleeves because you're his kid. He's called you. We love him because he first loved us. So for those who love him, for those who are the called according to his purposes, he is the God who's working all things for our good. And so it is the time for the church to be on its toes. Pastor Lanny said at prayer meeting this week that we need to be ready always to answer every meet, uh, person that, who asks us the reason of the hope that we have in Christ. And, and we need to do so in a spirit of, of, of meekness, but boldness. And so, dear ones, we are torn, right? You want to watch the news, but then you watch the news and you're, you're even more depressed and even more confused. And so we don't need another person telling us how to do life in general. And I want to say this. There are so many people who are giving polar opposite guidelines, and they both can't be right. The book of Proverbs says this. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. So often in life, we tend to agree with the last person that 
talk with us because they make their good arguments. So let me tell you the balance that our pastors are trying to strike, our deacons are trying to strike, all of our leader, ministry leaders at Center View are trying to strike. On the one hand, we must be in submission to governing authorities. There is no power but of God. On the other hand, in the book of Acts, Peter said when he was commanded not to even preach or teach in the name of Jesus, we ought to obey God rather than man. In all this hub-hub, and hearing people saying, you know, things like, the government can't interfere with us worshiping. I thought this would be a good time to talk about worship. The title of the message today, here it is. Worship is 24-7, not just Sunday at 11. It's not just something we do on Sunday night when we bring our kids to Iwana and, and come into the sanctuary with Pastor Mark. No, 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 dear ones. Worship is our life. Now, there's a lot of confliction going on. Your pastors care very deeply about what you think. At the same time, we can't be constricted by preaching the gospel according to what man says. In fact, Paul said this to the churches of Galatia. This is from the New American Standard Bible. For am I now seeking, to seek, uh, am I now seeking the favor of man or of God? Am I, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. If you've heard us say anything over and over again, is that Christ Jesus is the leader of this church. Christ Jesus is our only king, our ultimate one that we please. This message is for you, King Jesus. I will listen in. Your people will listen in. But everything we do is as to the Lord because he is Lord. At the same time, we do care for you. And we do know that there are misgivings. And I want to say that all the pastors and leaders at Center View are passionate about you, but we are even more passionate about God and his glory. So the Lord Jesus had a situation. He met a woman at a well. A woman who many Jewish people, especially men, would not even take the time to talk to in a public venue. But the Lord Jesus affirmed his life verse, 16 words, all one syllable, lest we should be confused. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You've heard me say in some of our introductory materials, that's from Luke 19.10. P.S. We all began our life lost until Jesus found us. So John MacArthur said of today's text, Jesus' revelation of himself to this woman demonstrated that God's love knows no limitations. It transcends all barriers, barriers of race, barriers of gender, barriers of ethnicity, barriers of religious tradition. In contrast to human love, divine love is indiscriminate and all-encompassing. I've quoted him because I cannot say it any better than that. And so, it all goes back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. My, my granddaughter loves, I'm teaching her this in the King James, that whosoever, it's a word we don't use so much, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the service today is entitled, Worship is 24-7. It's not just something at 11. So when people stand up and talk about the government interfering with our right to worship, that is not true. No matter what happens in the public venue, that is not true. Worship is something we are called to do as a manner of life, to pray without ceasing, to worship without ceasing. So if you're at home, you can stand with me if you care to. As I read John chapter 4, we're going to take a 30,000 foot view today. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, in other words, they did the physical baptizing, he left Judea and departed into Galilee. But he needed, very important words, he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. You know, when Christ took on flesh, he, he experienced thirst, he experienced pain, he experienced what we experience. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. 
For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Just Jesus and the woman. But the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Oh, Father, we know that the Samaritan woman was thinking on the physical level, on the natural realm. God, would you open our eyes to supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit to understand your words that are spirit, that are truth, that are life this day for your son's glory, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first truth we want to draw from today's text, dear ones, is that Jesus Christ, our Lord, he is the master teacher, masterfully guided this encounter from a simple conversation about water to a conversation about eternal life. He was moving the conversation from H2O, H2O to a conversation about living water. There's, there's so much we could learn about that all by itself. We need to be on our toes, seeking every opportunity to tell others. We need to be looking for segues to share the gospel. We haven't given out round two in a while because you haven't been here to get them. Uh, but dear ones, we're going to get back to it. We need to seek every opportunity. And the Bible says, um, I like the way the ESV and the NASB say it, he had to go through Samaria. Hmm, he had to? Yes. Pastor Mark's been leading us through the book of Acts. The outline for the book of Acts is chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in, 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 in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So beginning right there in their Jerusalem, they were to start carrying the gospel. He had to demonstrate this by showing that God does so love the world. He loves the people that the Jews referred to as Samaritans. They, I, I hate to even say it out loud, but you know, they were considered half-breeds, part Jewish and part Gentile. And the Jews, as the woman said, had no dealings with them, especially if they were Samaritans who were ladies. And so, dear ones, we're simple. I'm a simple. I'll speak for myself. I'm a simpleton. Here's what I believe this morning. God loves you. Here's what I believe uh, God's plan for you is uh, everlasting life. He is not willing for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Spurgeon was right when he said, salvation is all of grace and damnation is all of sin and self. God loves you. He created you to know you, to love you, and to give you eternal life. But this life comes through the woman, or comes through the, the man who was talking to the woman. She was thinking about physical water. He was telling her there's a way to be saved, to have eternal life bubbling up in your soul. And at this point, she didn't get it. But the master teacher is guiding her through. And this ground called Sychar uh, is an area in the Old Testament known as Shechem. And so many cool things happened in the Old Testament right there. Abraham had a rich history there. His son Jacob and daughter Dinah had, had, a, had a not so rich history there. Joseph was later buried there. And Jesus knew how to seize this opportunity. Jesus took on flesh. In all things, he became like us, the writer of Hebrews says. Philippians said he, he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself of, of the glory as to the worship of angels and, and the fellowship of the Father and the Spirit in, on his heavenly throne to take on human form and to experience all of our sorrows. He is the high priest who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows about thirst. He, knows, he knew about the fact that Jewish people had no dealings with Samaritans, and so he stunned her 
right out of the gate by saying these words, give me a drink. We don't get it uh, as, as much as she did. She was put back on her heels. How is it that you, being a Jew, are asking me for a drink? It's as if she's saying, don't you know this is a Jewish man? You're not supposed to have any dealings with me. And Jesus said, oh, if you only knew who was talking to you. If you only knew that you are, it kind of reminds me of the song, Mary, Did You Know? <laughs> the little boy uh, that you're raising is, is God the Son. And so the conversation continues, sir, you, you apparently have nothing to draw with. This well is deep. How are you, you going to get this living water that you're talking about? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? Uh, Jesus is going to jump on this conversation, of course. He does jump in the conversation. If you only knew who was asking you for this drink, you would ask him for a drink. And, and by the way, this, this concept of eternal life being thought of as a, as a drink, as, as a spiritual drink, is not new to the um, New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. My people have committed two sins, the prophet Jeremiah said. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They have hewed for themselves cisterns. Have you ever been to Europe? I've been to uh, the pleasure of being in Europe and um, going through um, ancient diggings in Rome and places like France and cisterns were big uh, pots that were dug into the earth and, and they held water. The problem with cisterns is they crack, the earth shifts and they break and the water runs out. He said, you, you've forsaken me, the living water, and you've got broken cisterns that can't hold water. Isaiah said, behold, God is my salvation. I, I will trust and not be afraid for Yah, that is short for Yahweh. The Lord is my strength, my song. He has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, with joy, I will draw waters from the wells of salvation. So King Jesus masterfully guided this conversation from a talk about water to a talk about reality, to, to, to a talk about her need for living water and he used the theme of worship to do so look with me at verses 16 through 24 jesus said to her go call your husband and come here now jesus knew the situation jesus said to her go call your husband and come here the woman answered i have no husband jesus said to her you have well said i have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one whom you are now with is not your husband in that you have spoken truly the woman said sir i perceive that you are a prophet uh you know the bible says before king jesus we stand uh, naked and, and unclothed our, uh, our our lives are fully exposed with the one with the eyes of him with whom we have to do and she knew something supernatural was going on here. And so she takes the conversation this way. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And you, the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. You know, that's where the temple is, don't you know? And Jesus said to her, woman, and that was not disrespectful. In fact, he was showing her amazing respect by encountering her at all. Believe me. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. Remember Paul's uh, speech to those who had erected uh, an altar, so to speak, to the unknown God, a monument to the unknown God. You worship whom you, don't, you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Remember Jonah's theme verse, salvation is of the Lord, the Lord as Pastor Mark likes to say, call one man Abraham, through whom he made one nation uh, the Jewish uh, kingdom, through whom he would bring one Savior, the Messiah, to die for the sins of the whole world. The hour is now coming, and now is. Why? Because God in the flesh is talking with her. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is such, the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. Those who worship him, just like Jesus must needs to go through Jerusalem, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
So the Lord Jesus took her to school on worship. Dear ones, it dismays me, in, in my uh, opinion, that some pastors are squandering an opportunity that's been presented. So many people are arguing about worshiping at a certain time in a certain place. Remember when we were building this, this sanctuary? It, it's really not that long ago. It, it, time flies when we are having fun, and we are having fun at Centerview. I think it was like six years ago, thereabouts, that we uh, either broke ground or moved into this new building. So often I would walk over in the old, in the, in the adult center. By the way, when you come back, you're going to see some fantastic improvements. Just exciting. Uh, take a walk through there. Some busy, happy hands have been really working hard, hard, hard. But I would walk over to the old sanctuary, which is now the adult center. I would slap the concrete wall and say, this is not the church. The church is not brick and mortar. It's not plywood and plaster. You are the church. You are the called out ones of God. And we need to get rid of thinking that worship is just something that happens. You know that I, I kind of loathe the phrase, who's your worship leader? What's the inference there? Well, worship is the fun part of church. You get to sing. They, people equate singing with worship. Now the actual service starts and Pastor Mark's going to preach or Pastor Mike's going to preach or Pastor Lane is going to break the word of life and... Oh, boring. No. Everything we do is worship, but not just Sunday at 11. Driving down the road in a godly manner is or is not worship. Submitting to authorities can be worship. Paul was summing it up for the church at Corinth. Whatsoever you do in word or, or deed, whether you eat, whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. It is loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. And there is no salvation apart from repentance, from sin and faith in Christ. Calvin said, no one seeks a solution unless he first believes that there's a problem. Woman, you have a problem. You have, you have a completely misguided thinking about the concept of, of worship that is what king jesus is teaching her she tries the same change the subject mm -hmm -hmm. our fathers say we worship here you say worship she was very uncomfortable with this one who wanted to give her living water and so she tries to change the subject jesus will have none of it the father is seeking those who are ready and willing by his grace by his amazing grace to worship him in spirit and in truth, worship. What is it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, one writer said, worship is red hot love for God demonstrated by obedience to God. Who said that? Well, I did. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. I probably got it from someone else. Here's the thing, dear ones. The very word worship comes to us from a Greek word that is, in this text, a verb. It's the indicative voice. God is calling us to action. It's something we must do. And proskuneo is, is what it literally means. It, it, if you look up this word uh, in the Greek, and it's the same in English properly translated, it is to prostrate oneself before the Lord. It is literally, I remember when, Adrian Rogers had a call upon his life to preach the gospel. And like Billy Graham, like so many others, he had a great uh, struggle with preaching the word, you know, ferociously as the inerrant word of God. And he did, I've heard this testimony from so many others, but Adrian Rogers said he got on the Lord before the Lord and off in the woods by himself. And he got so low before the Lord said, Lord, I need to hear a word from you about your word. And he said he just felt by the spirit led to dig a, 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 a hole with his hands and he shoved his face in the hole and said god speak to me through thy word and of course god did speak to him through his word but he humbled himself Do you know that literally that word means to fall on uh, to fall prone before god to put your face before god to bow before god to worship god and i want to say dear ones if you think about the ten commandments how does it begin I am the Lord thy God. You are to have no gods before me. You're not to make any craven image like unto me. You're not to bow down. You're not to worship them. Our, the Lord our God is a, is a jealous God in that regard. Why? There is nothing more glorious than our God. 
and, and glory for anything else is idolatry. A, a desire for anything else is pure idolatry. God himself must protect his own glory, for there is no other God. There are false gods, lowercase g. And so, dear ones, we must learn what it means to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I want to tell you, once again, the word worship, our English word, comes from an, uh, an Anglican word that was actually spelled worth-ship. In its truest sense, it is our attempt to ascribe worth, to ascribe the glory to God that is due to his name. And we sing songs that tell us how hopeless, how, how, uh, uh, how, fall, how uh, short we fall of the ability to worship God in spirit and truth. The, psalmist, uh, the song read, wrote, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. I, I do not have the ability to articulate the worth that is due to your name, Master. And what of spirit and truth? John MacArthur said, In spirit means to worship not by external conformity to religious rituals, but by a proper attitude of heart. And that is why I'm so grieved that the conversations are all about worshiping at this time or, or at that time in public or in private. Now, that's a whole other story. And we are going to continue to worship in public. But dear ones, MacArthur had it right. It's the heart attitude first. And in truth means to worship God consistent. Here it is with his revealed word, consistent with the scriptures. And that's why when people want to talk about a, a supernatural experience and then they begin to uh, talk about a vision and someone saying this to them or that one of them, I, my response, you know what, it always is the same. Tell me what chapter and what verse I'm going to read along with you. Oh, no, this is a different revelation. Not interested. It is worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth, focused on Christ, the word made flesh who ultimately revealed himself to us. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him to us. And Jesus said, I am the way I am the truth. And no man cometh unto the father except through me. And again, Moses taught us through the Lord. Worship is job one. I mean, when Jesus, it's a different way of saying it, but it is the same thing. When Jesus asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is the first that is the embodiment of the first four commandments. And the second is likened to it, which is the embodiment of the next six commandments. Beginning with mommy and daddy, you are to love neighbor as, as self. Worship is red hot love for the Lord. And in fact, when people say, I love the Lord, but they are living in disobedience, I must tell you the truth. Uh, they don't have a love problem. They have a sin problem. They have an obedience problem. Because Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments so all biblical teaching and preaching must include the gospel scripture and and all scripture points to who a person and his name is none other than the lord jesus christ so once again she tried to change the subject once again jesus christ brought her back to ground zero and christ is ground zero without him we can do nothing so Jesus guided the conversation from that which was talking about actual water to living water, to eternal life through the gospel, through the incarnation, the cross work, the death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus guided the conversation then to how it is we are to worship this God who sent his son to die for us that we might know him. That is that we are to worship him in spirit and in truth. And then Jesus finally masterfully guided the conversation from an encounter uh, uh, that began with a simple conversation to about our need for making a confession in Christ as Lord and Savior. So the woman said this at verse 25, I know Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, the anointed of God, when he comes, he will tell us all things. So notice the progression that takes place here. First, Christ is coming. Then she wonders aloud, could this be the Christ? Then Jesus tells her, I am the Christ. Then, and only then, she confesses, I've met one who is the Christ. 
So as a Samaritan, she at least knew this. Messiah is coming. What she didn't know, what she couldn't know until Jesus opened her eyes to know it, is that the very man who was talking with her was God incarnate, God the Son. So Jesus did reveal to her in verse 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Preachers often talk about videos they'd like to see in heaven. This is one I'd like to see when God reveals himself to her plainly. At this point, the disciples came into the scene at verse 27. They marveled that he talked with a woman. Remember, she had it right. You Jewish men don't have any dealings with Samaritans, and especially a woman. Yet no one asked him, what are you seeking? Why are you talking with her? I love that, that they didn't talk back to the master. That, that's a good word right there. The truth, truth is she did not yet understand Christ. She did not yet understand his mission. But dear ones, this would be a good time to remind the church we have a mission. The mission isn't altered by, by a pandemic. It's never going to be altered until Jesus comes again. We are to go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. I'm mentoring a young man during our day who's 23 years of age. And uh, in the past month or so, he's memorized 10 scriptures. These two that I'm sharing with you are two of them. The Great Commission from, from Matthew, also, as Mark leads us through Acts, but you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we explain, beginning right where you are and then intentionally, purposely carrying the gospel to the end of the earth. So this woman left her water pot. She went her into the city, which is her Jerusalem, and she began, come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Go call your husband. Uh, not married right at the moment. Correct. You've had five, and the one you're now living with, number six, you're not even married to. Come see a man who told me all things. Only this must be the Christ. Could this be the Christ? They went out from the city and came to him. And the text indicates the results. Many others believed. Look with me at verse 39. We're going to fast forward. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him. Why? Because of the word of the woman who testified. Oh, dear ones, when Jesus prayed for us in John 17, he said, there are many children that are going to come to faith through the word of, of my disciples and uh, those who are made disciples from my disciples, and that is going to keep on until Jesus comes. So that when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay. He stayed two days, and many more believed because of why? What did John MacArthur say? Worship always must be seated in the word of God because of the word. The disciples of Christ at this point were thinking on a worldly plane. They were thinking of uh, not so much as spiritual things. They said, Lord Jesus, you know, I, I know you don't have any food in verse 32. Uh, that, uh, and then they continue verse 33. Has anyone brought the master someone to eat? I love what Jesus said. My food my meat, my sustenance, that which sustains me and, and makes me to thrive is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And you know, Christ did create this world. He did speak it into existence by the word of his power. He did take, after he made Adam and Eve and after the fall, he did take on flesh and become one of us. He walked the dusty trails that we walk. He suffered as we suffer he wasn't always tempted as we are he did not deserve to die but he took on our sin that by his stripes we might be healed and just before his cross work he could say with absolute confidence as if it were already done father i have finished the work that you have given me to do the hours come glorify thy son thy son may also glorify thee and then in just a few hours jesus on his actual finish of his mission upon his death, lowered his head and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. In John's gospel, he uses the word to talisti. It is a verb that indicates a perfect and continuing work. It is finished. Dear ones, the mandate has not changed. Methodologies change. Our sound booth crew, you know, uh, had to laugh uh, at me sometimes. I was talking with Brother... Um, Oak is today that uh, sometimes when I have to do a wedding or, or, a t or a small funeral, you know, I'll call Pastor Mark and say, now, how do I turn on the soundboard again? He said, there's a button. It's called on. 
please press it. Uh, there's a switch called A, volume, please turn it. Uh, so <laughs> it is no joke to say I am technologically deficient. But this week I had to sign a contract, a legal contract. I really didn't want to do it online, but Mikey had to do it online. Go to the page, open it up, scroll down, check a block with an electronic signature, read these pages. Finally, if you agree to this, click it. Dear ones, I want you to pretend you're with me online and you've come to a block and here's what it says. It's, a, it's the confession that the woman made. I'm going to expand down a little bit. Are you willing to make this confession? Heavenly Father, I, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I, I talked with someone even today that, that uh, I think he had a mixture of tears of joy and tears of, of confession, and it always warms my heart. Those are tears that I always welcome. So the prayer is, Father, I know I'm a sinner, that my sin has separated me from you. By your grace, I now turn from my sin. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my heart. I believe that your son died for me, was buried for me, and rose again from the dead to save me. As best as I know how, I turn from my sin and trust you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Forgive me and help me to live for you 24-7. In Jesus' name and a prayerful dependence on Jesus, I pray. Amen. So here's the question. Will you click that box? Will you quit trying to live in your own strength and in your own power? For those of you who have already clicked that box, will you, like the woman, begin telling people of a man who told you all things? A man who revealed, I, I love it when someone hears the preaching or teaching of God's word and they feel that that personally was a spear in their chest, that God was speaking to them. Is God speaking to you today? Will you, by his grace, say, enough already of my sin? I, I want to know you whom to know his life eternal. He will never refuse a prayer that is a prayer of repentance and faith, a prayer turning from sin, trusting Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. When you do, here's what I want to say. Worship is not just something that happens for an hour on Sunday or even two hours on Sunday or even three hours on Sunday or even just a, an hour or two on Wednesday. Worship, dear ones, is prostrating ourselves before God when we wake up, as we live, as we work, as we do family life, as we drive, as we lay our head in the pillow. It is giving all we know of ourselves to all we know of God, seeking his honor, seeking his glory, letting everything to be done be done for the glory of Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, we don't have the opportunity for you to walk the aisle and, and, to, and to shake a preacher's hand right now, but we've got those phone numbers posted to our site. We've got the email lines, and, and we, we would love for you to reach out and talk to us. Our phones have been burning up, and we are loving it. We are loving it. Keep those phone calls. Keep those texts. Keep those voicemails coming, and we will chat with you one-on-one. -on -one. Let's stand and let's sing together that song, Just As I Am. I got a few helpers. I got no piano, but I got a few helpers today. Just as... I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. I'm going to say air hug, and we'll probably be saying air hug for a little bit yet, but soon and very soon to those who live in Jacksonville, we'll be able to say um, air hug six feet apart and not over the net. God bless. Love you. See you soon. Mm -hmm.